possession crucial from this. How much longer will the referee allow? Dublin lead by a point. And there's the whistle. It's over. It's over. We earned it by winning the last two matches on the road, and that's not going to be taken away from us. But what I love in Hurling, I love players that will never give in. He hits it. He hits it. Right. It's over the bar. Hello, welcome to the RTGA podcast. Hope you're all well. Um, we're a day late coming to you this week. It's not because the bank holiday. It's because Rory O'Neill needed an extra day to just process what happened down in Parky Cueve, and I needed three days to get over bringing a three-year-old and a five-year-old to Wexford Park. But only one, it only one, only only one day to process that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's fine. It was a lot of work bringing the two of them, but the abuse mm. they showered on Thomas Walsh for the match really paid off towards the end there. So um, it, it worked out well. Um. I'm joined by Jackie Tyrrell and uh, Rory O'Neill as always. How are you doing, lads? Good, Mikey. How are you, Mikey? Very good. Ah, we're all right, we're all right. We're a bit bunged up. We'll survive. So everybody else has to listen to me. Um, I'd love to start with Wexford Park, but I, I think in terms of the championship and how the launching off point and what we're all going to be thinking about for the next couple of months, uh, I think we can only start in Parky Cueve, really. Um, sorry, Roy. Where uh, Cork were handed yet another beating by their bet noirs now at this stage Limerick. I think, Jackie, if you look back over the last three meetings in the last eight or nine months in championship, uh, the um, uh, the average winning margin for Limerick is 12 points. So Cork had a, a relatively encouraging spring, you know, and thought they were maybe getting a couple of blocks in place. But um, since that, uh, since the um, since the end of the league to now, it does seem that things aren't in place and they're absolutely no closer to cracking the Limerick puzzle than they were eight months ago. Yeah, they did seem to be building some blocks, Mikey, but by God, those blocks came tumbling down on Sunday. The Limerick uh, green monster just drove straight through them and, you know, they just, for Cork players, for Cork management, for Cork supporters, where do they start? How do they pick up the pieces from that? Because, you know, the definition of madness is doing the same thing over and over again. And taking even, you know, the All-Ireland last year, what they did and what they didn't do. Uh, and I'm looking more from a defensive point of view. You know, they, they they were so naive at the back. They were left so exposed in the All-Ireland last year. They come back, they have a really competitive league, do a lot of good things and seem to be kind of getting things back on the road. Daryl Leary at three. Uh, their defence just seemed to be a bit more aggressive. You look at the... I know it was the league and it was, it was Limerick's, probably not their strongest team. But physically, when Cork went up and took Limerick on, you know, they really went at them and they were aggressive. They hunted in packs and you said, you know what, things are looking good. Then you go to the league final and you see this absolutely defensive just falling apart completely. You look at Tim O'Mahony, Mark Coleman, the questions were raised about them. And I look at the Limerick game the weekend and it's like, you, you ask the question, what did they do in two weeks? Well, personnel-wise, they didn't do a whole lot. They didn't change a whole lot. Daryl Leary obviously went out whether he was injured or dropped. We don't know. Damien Callan came in, but they just did the same thing again and again. Like, like I think of Cork and you think of the great people have got the freedom of Cork City, Sonia Sullivan and Ray Keane. What did Garrod Hagerty do to get the freedom of Parky Cueve to weekend? <laughs> he he yeah. just strolled around. Like, Tim O'Mahony didn't lay a hand on him. You know, Kieran Joyce. Like, I would argue that the two best defensive Cork players the weekend that actually showed a bit of fight. A 19-year-old? A 19-year-old? Jackie? I, I, I would say it was Shane Barrett yeah. at 11 and Jeremy Lerk at 9. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Imo isn't a defender. Mark Coleman is a wing back, but they didn't change anything at all. I, I thought if I was a defender and what happened to me to the All Ireland last year, I would be seeding. And I know if I was a Nackle Kenny team, Noel Hickey and JJ Laney, we'd be seeding. We couldn't wait to get back at Limerick. This was their chance. This isn't like that they didn't know about that this was coming down the tracks. Fair enough if they got bet by Limerick, but have a go, take a few yellow cards, get in their face, let, don't let Keane Lynch put the ball over on his knees with half a broken hurl. Like, I just, it just, I, I just don't know where Cork go from here now. It was so disappointing from a Cork point of view. Um, like, I, it, and that's just from a defensive point of view. The lack of movement in the forward is another ball game completely. But this isn't, this Cork team is better than, better than they are. But I just wonder what the culture is there from a defensive point of view. It looks like they don't really know how to play as a system, of, as a six backs with two midfielders dropping back to help. Their half forward line don't really come back to help. They, they're, they're disjointed. And really, it was a shambolic Cork performance the weekend. Who were you thinking stood up, Rory? Sorry, who's, who's your teenage I thought I, I thought Kieran Joyce, for a, a, such a young lad, 
going in there uh, into the furnace of championship in front of 40,000 people. I thought he acquitted himself admirably given what was going on around him. But he picked up Tom Morrissey, did he? Yeah, but like that was, he did a reasonable yeah, job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, but you shouldn't be having to hang your hat on a 19 year old lad coming <laughs> into, you know, like he shouldn't be the fella that you should be expecting your leadership from. Yeah. And that was the big thing for me. I just didn't see anybody. I mean, I was looking back, right? The last time Cork beat Limerick in the championship was 2019 and around Robin Blown Gaelic grounds. And I was looking at some of the personnel that played that day. And there would be a lot of gripes and a lot of whinging and, and a lot of giving out locally about the likes of Bill Cooper, about, um, about Owen Cadigan. Um, I Daniel think Carney that, that day. Daniel Carney, right? Uh, not, maybe not so much given out about Daniel, but Daniel's work rate and in terms of his ability to put in a shift while in the forwards, pay, like, it should, like it actually shows up the forwards that were there on Sunday. It, you know, like I would say Daniel Carney could still do a job given what we got in terms of change out of the forwards that started. And also, another thing was that particular day, I think was the day that Mark Ellis got brought from the, the terrace effectively straight into number six. Now, Mark Ellis was playing football in New York over the weekend. I'd be sending another SOS for Mark Ellis at this stage like, and get him on a flight back because, I mean, if you look at the, we say those four players particularly, Mark Ellis, Bill Cooper, Daniel Kearney and Owen Cadigan, there at least was an element of being able to physically mix it with opponents from those types of players. And they're the types of players that Cork have lost to be replaced with players that simply don't have that kind of game in them or not fitted for it. They're not set up in that way. I don't know. But I mean, as Jackie said, like, I mean, it was like Groundhog Day and um, it really is a very, very difficult puzzle now from here in terms of where do they go. Now, the only thing is, if there's any sort of silver lining, at least they're not out again next weekend. They have two weeks. I think it'll actually help for all the whinging and wondering about Ed Sheeran. I think it's a brilliant thing that it's up in Thurlis and it's not it's not in Cork, <laughs> right? I actually think that's a good thing. Um, it's also not on TV. Um, and, um, oh God, your silver lining is yeah. pretty grim, Rory. <laughs> You're you know, strong, Rory. I, but I also think that's 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 probably not a bad thing that it's hidden away to a certain extent. And um, I, I I'd say there's a pretty pretty strong level of dispiritedness around Cork, so there might be a massive support depending on how Claire go at the weekend. They'll probably go into it. You know, I wouldn't necessarily say it being written off. Jesus, their backs are against the wall now and they're going to have to produce something And because their season could be over very, very quickly. Very, Rory, very can, Rory, can I ask you a question? And it also shows, by the way, it also shows, it also shows, by the way, the league. I mean, what's the league work now, you know? Mm. Rory, Jackie, in a, sorry, Jackie. In, in a county in the size of Cork, right, and I'm looking back and, and I'm thinking of that great mm. Cork team and it's probably unfair because they were so good as the benchmark. In the size of Cork, we say since since Dermot O'Sullivan and Ronan Curran left, you know, you're talking probably 2010, 11, right? 10, 11, 12 years. Yeah. Surely there's a years. three and a six within the whole of all the clubs in Cork that can they can man down that 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 centre of the defence better than what's been done in the last, like I go back to 2013 when you opened up the gate and let Pat Donnellan run down the middle of, middle of Trotty and set up that goal since then he haven't addressed that problem are those players just not there or are we missing something I think look I think for a start I think the old uh, there's a couple of things this is pretty complicated and we won't we won't get into it too much I think there's one major major problem which nobody will speak about because it feeds into this notion that Cork are soft right I've, I am of the firm belief because I watch enough of it. The game is simply refereed differently in Cork. We apply the rules in Cork, right? <laughs> right? You, might, you, might, you might believe that, but we actually do. We apply the rules in Cork. And the game is refereed totally differently in intercounty level. And there's a huge gap between, you know, what lads understand what they can get away with at intercounty level and trying to marry that with not fouling at the same time. And I think that's, 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 that's one issue. I think another issue is we simply haven't produced good enough defenders in, in that period. No, there is a very, there's a special talent coming. The only, no problem, 
the only problem there is he could, he could go to rugby. <laughs> play rugby, yeah. You know, so and he will. He look if if they if if they can do something to hold on to him. Look, he'll play number six for the next fifteen years, and he will be he will be special. Mm. Who are you talking about, Roy? Sorry, ben, ben O'Connor, Ben O'Connor, O'Connor from yeah. the Bars. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like he is a special talent, but like you mightn't hold on to him. I mean, if he gets an opportunity for a professional career to make him to make a living out of playing sport, would you blame the lad for going to do that? No, you wouldn't. Um, we don't, I suppose, Jack. You want to get too bogged down in Cork's woes, even though it is entertaining. Because Limerick were outstanding. Yeah. They were. Yeah, that's that's like standing. And and Jackie, there, there's part of me now. I don't like to mix ears and kind of shoehorn it into the conversation, but there's part of me that looked at those Cork players. They looked up the field. They saw everyone was marked, and they turned around back towards their own goal and hand passed it, and they got bottled up. And part of it made me think of your Kilkenny team and how reluctant anybody was to put the ball down on top of your half back line in, in particular. Um, and we talk about running hurling, we talk about working it through the lines. But if you have, if you have a six six defenders that nobody wants to land the ball on top of, then you give the opposition no option but to play a running game. And then it's very easy for your midfielders and your forwards to defend that game. And the game starts to look awfully easy when obviously it's not. Obviously, it, it all starts with having six defenders who Cork would rather run back towards their own goal with the ball than puck the ball on top of. Yeah, you're kind of damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. If you go long, you'll have Declan Hannan, Hannan sitting and by design, Barry Nash probably will, won't be a million miles away as well. So you have a screen there. You go short and try running through the lines. You have that massive half-forward line that just repel you back or turn you over. You have William O'Donoghue just, that just goes around and just hunts lads down. Like, this guy is... I think he's really special for what he mm. does mm. and there's no one like him out there. So that's the conundrum do you go long or do you go short I suppose if you do go long you do have to have really really good ball winners inside the likes of TJ Reid who can win it 2v1 Conor McDonald, these kind of, the likes of Lee Chin you need an outlet like that inside and pacey lads who can r- run and cr- create some element of space <clears throat> I suppose from the Cork point of view they just kind of ran straight down the middle the first tackle if they didn't get through they'd go back they recycle I think if you're going at this Limerick team, you need to stretch him. You need to keep weight in him. They're half hour in, like to keep nice and tight. You bounce off one tackle, there's another tackle there. But when you get at this Limerick team, you need to break the first tackle. So when you run that ball out, create space. Like Cork have pace, so why not use that pace? Why not get your half foot back line? Stretch him when you have the ball. Create avenues where you can run down it. Like how many times did Limerick swarm tackle a Cork player? But my question would be, where's the two and three extra defenders are supporting him. Where's the Run lad off running the shoulder, off the corner? Yeah. Where's Dar Fitzgibbon taking it off? Like, that's how they created the goal. Do you know, they just seem to kind of, oh, there's a Limerick lad, I'll go back, I'll go back to Patrick Collins. How many times did look up the field with no options? So Cork didn't play it to their strengths. But the question is, Limerick have created an absolute serious conundrum, and that's purely by design. And then when they do get the ball, the thing that they're probably understated on their skill levels, their execution, like they make the ball transition so quickly and easy that we, we've just kind of taken it for granted. That's true repetition. That's a well-oiled machine. And when they get their chances, they take the goal. They just have a lovely marry of physical physicality, like a really good, well-designed system. They all know the roles of it. Like you look at their defence, how comfortable they are. I think Barry Nash got two points the weekend from play. Declan Hannon won. Uh, Dermot Burns three like these lads are total hurlers so comfortable on the ball but they just they know their roles they're able to mix it any way at all possible so how do you get about it you need a guy inside that you can put the ball in that will stick and you can create things but you also need runners you need to create weight you need to have Garrod Hager the out kind of man mark and his left half back where he's totally taken out of play and be able to run at him and create space and break those tackles Easier said than done, but Cork made it way too easy from the weekend. Right, the, Mark Keane's name screams out at me. I know he's not an accomplished hurler. I know he's been well. That's not fair. He's been away from the game for a few years for obvious reasons. He was he was in Australia. He's a target man. He's a big physical. Like it, he is he not an option? In I know Seamus Hardy was taken out of the equation by illness, was it at the weekend? Yeah, he, yeah. He, he would he would have been he would have been a target man of sorts. But Keane probably add another two, three inches on and probably a fair few kilos to what Harnady is. He is at least that target man, if not, a, 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 you know, kind of a marquee forward. But how sharp is his hurling, Mikey? Mm. You know, I mean, you're away from the game for two years. As I said to you before, like to someone like him, it's he, he, he kind of, he, he presents the same type of problem that Aidan Walsh presented the Cork management when he decided to come back from football in that, like, yeah, a brilliant target man 
pro- probably well able to stick the paw up and, and secure primary possession. But if his hurling isn't sharp enough, like that Limerick defence, right across, their inside backs are just as good as their outside backs, and they can all hurl. Can Mark hurl to the same, with, with that same level of crisp, crispness, that same level of sharpness? You know, so soon back up, so soon back from Australia. I'm not so sure yet. I'd be interested to see if they've obviously not given him a chance. Like they, they gave him a few runs in the league against Offaly, where you know, look, you can probably take a chance in that kind of a game. We didn't really see him at all on Sunday. So, I mean, I don't know. I don't, I, I, I. He only just, played one game in the league, didn't he, Rory and Antrim? He, didn't he get a yeah? Yeah, started he one. I think he came on in a couple, did he? He came on in a couple. He started against Offaly. So I would imagine, look, what they're seeing in training is just somebody who's hurling maybe just isn't up to the level yet to maybe go into mm. championship. Now, look, it might be the case of they have no choice this weekend. Well, see, it's a different problem. Like Limerick presents you with a different problem than in pretty much everybody yeah, else. Yeah, that's the thing. And, and, and like the chances are Cork could go out and hurl up a storm against Clare in two weeks' time. And everyone goes, oh, that's your tall fix now. But it's not really, because we, you could be back facing Limerick again in the semi-final, and you'll end up in the same situation. That's, so that's the problem. That's it, Jackie, isn't it? That, like, it's, we're, we're judging Cork harshly here, because Cork have achieved so much, but they're coming up against this big green monster, as you say. And, it's get, like, and we've discussed it here, and Rory, more than anyone, has made the case that Limerick are relying on a very settled starting 15 when they're fit, you know, and they play a very physical game, which could be attritional. And then you say, okay, well, you know, they are missing one of their inside forward line and it's not quite working for them. I should just stick Kyle Hayes up there and you'll score one, one. But but we saw Kyle Hayes hobble off lads. You know, I do think, I do think like, I mean, Jackie, you'll probably know this. No, in fairness to your Kilkenny team, he always had ones and twos coming in just to freshen things up, I suppose. Like he is going to the well with more or less the same personnel all the time. Like, will that eventually catch up with them? I don't think it'll catch up with them this year, and I think they will win three in a row. Cahill O'Neill did come on and score two yeah, points, yeah. so, you know, but, but he, he's, my, he's my, the one that... My case, he slotted back, lads, as if he that's, was never that's, there. That's, that's, that's true, yeah, yeah. And that can't be can't that can't that be going unnoticed, lads. Two crucials. Yeah. His last game, I think, was Kilkenny in 2000. And, and Peter whatever. Casey's nearly fit by all accounts. Is he? Yeah, you know, yeah. so... No, I, w- I will say one or two key guys, I do remember in 10 when we lost Henry, Brian Hogan... John Tennyson played in All-Ireland with a crew should probably wasn't 100%. It did hurt us. So you take a Keane Lynch, you take a, probably a William O'Donoghue, you take maybe a, a Declan Hannan or a, Jim, or a Kyle Hayes out of that team. You know, that could really hurt them because those guys you don't really replace. But at the minute, you know, hats off to their S&C coach, to their physios, because they're consistently able to turn out the same 13, 14 guys week in, week out. Yeah. Now, um, I was reading Kieran Shannon this morning in The Examiner, and he kind of said, well, we know the top two in Munster now, anyway, after the first round of games. Uh, and I can see his point. Obviously, Waterford and Limerick do seem head and shoulders against probably anybody in the country, never mind just Munster. But to me, Jackie, I, I thought Tipperary asked some questions of Waterford. They answered them in the end. But like, I, I think Tipperary showed that they could be they could be a force to reckon with in this Munster Championship yet. Maybe not win it, but at least <laughs> make everybody else less sure of their place in the world than they were, you know, four days ago. Well, third is up for grabs now, isn't it? Mm. It is. It definitely is. And I, I think that's just as fascinating. You will get nothing easy off this Tipperary team. You look at them, the way they play the weekend, the new guys they brought in, James Quigley, full back, Craig Morgan, uh, Mark Yo, Dylan Quirk. Like, they're starting to rebuild there again. You still have the likes of Noel McGrath, who's outstanding. Oh, he was Martin. amazing. Amazing, oh, McGrath. His performance was, was, was mesmerising. Uh, John McGrath didn't play, came on. They're no pushover. And this Clare team is no pushover either, you know? So... I wouldn't be signing off yet on... Uh, I don't think Cork will make the, the top three, but I wouldn't be signing off on Waterford and Limerick. Yeah, the trend is looking like it's going to be a month of final with them. But I would have a sneaky feeling for this Clare team uh, getting in third, and I wouldn't be surprised if they ended up in a month of final just yet. It, do, it does make it very interesting, though, lads, from Liam Cahill's perspective. And I know, look, there's always the old, oh, you have to go to win every game. But if you were the manager of Watford, you're heading down to Limerick next Saturday night, right? And you, there's a very good chance you're probably saying to yourself, Jesus, we could end up playing these lads three times this year, right? Where we're definitely playing them next Saturday night. Um, we might end up meeting them in Munster final. And the chances are, if we have any ambitions to win the All Ireland, we'll probably have to take them on again. So, what do you do next Saturday night? You know, 
Do you, get do, the you, do, you, do you do a Pep Guardiola and do you do a <laughs> I get the feeling you only you'll only beat this Limerick type team once in the once. championship. So yeah. whether you want to leave it to a knockout <laughs> yeah, scenario, yeah, yeah. give them the ammo now and beat them <laughs> and they come back like yeah. I'm not it's, gonna say like ravenous animals because it's bad yeah. anyway, but like yeah, yeah, it's 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 a tricky one. Yeah. It is a fair it's a fair question and, and one we might return to on Thursday, I think. Mm. But I just Jackie, there's I saw a few people from Claire of a Claire persuasion complaining at the weekend that they weren't featuring in any of the preview shows or anybody's written previews. Nobody was writing about Claire. I think there's a very simple reason for that. They weren't playing at the weekend. They weren't playing. <laughs> Claire, <laughs> Claire had a week on everybody. So, okay, they weren't written about or talked about as much as others. But now they've seen everybody else play. They've had an extra week's training, which is obviously going to be a benefit. And now they're coming, they're coming up to Semple to play a Tipperary team who are going to be definitely on their toes and a bit buoyed after their, you know, valiant defeat maybe in Tipperary they don't talk about valiant defeats but considering the chat beforehand it was pretty valiant this this has this shapes up to be a dinger and as you said Claire slightly unknown quantity yeah and it's it's going to be the game that probably is going to be not really spoken of as much as obviously the marquee one which mm. is Waterford and um Waterford and Limerick but yeah I think this is going to be a cracker of a game mm. um you know Claire love coming to Turles Tipperary will be looking to bounce back you know, I, I, I'm not going to say they'll get momentum from the weekend, but it was definitely, there was strong elements of the performance that they can build on and really look forward to the Clare game. So it's an interesting one. And from from Clare's point of view, they got to sit back and see what's going on. I'm sure Brian Lonan was down in Walsh Park watching the watching what Tipperary did. He'll have a plan maybe for Noel McGrath. He'll be able to look at different things. What are they going to do with Mark Keogh? Because Conor Cleary, who's had a really good league, that would be a really good duel as well. So, you know, I suppose Mark Keogh probably caught Watford off guard a bit. Um, and that's the beauty of being able to sit back and watch what's going on in the first round. So I'm looking forward to that game as well. Mm, yeah, yeah, no, it, it, it should be a cracker. So look, Munster, as expected, is 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 in good fettle. Um, the Leinster Championship, um, because of the nature of a Jackie, the six teams, um, we're always likely to get a couple of lopsided games in the first round because two of the, shall we say, quote unquote, big guns are meeting in Wexford Park. Um so we won't dwell too much on that. Westmeath did themselves a lot of credit. And I think the, fa- the fact that Brian Cody had to bring TJ Reid in in the second half, I'm sure he probably always planned to, but the fact is TJ Reid made a difference. And I think uh, I think it was good for the people at Cusick Park and Mullingar that they got to see TJ Reid. They might have felt a bit cheated if he hadn't come on because by all accounts, I was chatting to uh, a mate of mine here from uh, who I play hurling with, but he's from Westmeath. And he went down and he said the second half, he said TJ Reid is just... He's just a phenomenon. Just the, the impact he had in that game. Like I know it was Westmeath, but um, it shows he is still, you know, he's still critical, isn't he? He is, yeah. And it was actually similar because we went up there in 06 to play a first round of a, a Leinster. And for 40, 45 minutes, we had our, our work cut out. And I just think the bit of experience and a bit of probably extra fitness that we had that time. And it was similar the weekend, you know, TJ had to come on and they got a few goals at the end. But for 45, 50 minutes, it was, it was tit for tat. And it was great to see at the end, I think TJ was surrounded by Westmead fans. And it's great. That's 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 what we need. You know, we need to, to continue to build the hurling in these counties that are coming to the fore. Um, but, you know, TJ is, 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 although the legs might be as quick, the brain is still as quick as ever. And you even see that quick little free did with Owen Cody and he got the end, on the end of it. Um, so it would have been a nice one from Kilkenny point of view, get TJ back, probably might start this week or maybe get a, a, a few more minutes in, into him as well. And, you know, during the week I was thinking, would you like a perceived earlier, uh, easier passage with all due respect to Alicia Mesme, get your four points on the board and then, go take on the big tree. Uh, the fixer on. computer has been pretty kind to Kilkenny now, hasn't it? It has. But then I look at Wexford's who, you know, tough game uh, last weekend, got a good point out with Westmead come this weekend, they'll, they'll fancy their chance. Now it's Dublin there. this weekend. Or Dublin this weekend yeah. and then and then taking it on again. So it's, it's, it depends which way you look at. Um, yeah. But yeah, definitely Kilkenny will be looking to get four points on the board and then what, what a game we have then heading up to Salt Hill, then the Maybland Calder weekend, Kilkenny yeah. Calder. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll go to, 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 to matters in Wexford Park, Rory. Um, it was it was not a high quality game of hurling. I'm not going to lie. It was uh, very much an opening round match played in kind of murky enough conditions. Um, one thing I thought, one thing that was very noticeable to me um, is Galway are very physical. They wouldn't, they'd get an awful lot of cards in the Cork Championship if they were to play the way they're playing. Um, they are very, very phys- they're very big, they're very strong, and they are. Let, let's, uh, uh, Thomas Walsh was getting the abuse, obviously, and we, we might get onto the free in a, in a little bit because it was a very odd decision. 
uh, but then I saw Galway fans saying, "Oh well, no, he he let him not, you know he was he was on top of Galway from the start." I actually thought he was quite easy on Galway because I really think whether it's the Henry Shefflin uh, influence or whether it's just the players they have, they they're a very big team. That's the way to play. They're a very physical team, and you look at them and think, "Hmm, them against Limerick, <laughs> the height of championship could be a very interesting game." Very interesting. I think they're probably themselves and Watford and and look. Henry and Jackie will probably know this. I mean, I don't know how did you did you often mark Henry in training? Did you ever mark Henry in training, Jackie? I'd imagine you did. Yeah. Hen- Henry, matches, yeah. Henry was well able to mix it, like so. You can be sure if it, there's a team under Henry that they're definitely going to be fronting up on the physical stakes, and they won't be from wanting on that on that front. Um, I think in terms of the 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 standard, I wouldn't necessarily worry about that all that much. I do think, and again, not to be harping on about it, but. You do have to remember, like we are playing, we're start, like if you think back, the best championship we've had in many, many years is 2018. It was a brilliant summer. The weather was, you know, sultry, beautiful, sunny conditions, very little wind, you know, got, you know, 20 degrees nearly all the way through. And it was all played right through the best months of the year. Like the, the wind was howling again in Cork on Saturday. The wind was howling, I'm sure it was in Wexford Park on Saturday night. These are going to have a fact. These are going to have factors on the standard. Like it is going to be, it is going to affect how the game is played to a certain extent. There's no point in denying that. Um, and I think from a Wexford perspective, I think Dennis Walsh mentioned it. And it's a great phrase. They won the draw. I think some team always wins the draw. And I think Wexford won the draw. And I think Galway have only themselves to blame. Oh God! I know I'm telling you, we won the draw. This the, the yeah. celebrations when that final free went over. Um, just <laughs> I, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm restraining myself. I don't want to talk about Wexford too much. That's why all the Galway questions. But, but Jackie, um, Galway were very wasteful. Um, they hit I think ten wides in the first half, and a lot of them were from freeze. Um, I, I know uh, Cooney kind of got his eye in later in the game, but you know. They seem to since Joe kind of got like Evan Nyland was on was on the freeze for a good bit of the league. Now it's Connor Cooney, um. So that seems to be a slight issue. It's an issue for Wexford as well, obviously, because if Lee Chin's not fit, there's not really Rory O'Connor. I don't think is terribly comfortable taking freeze. It just shows you counties that just have an established known free taker. They almost take it for granted because the counties that don't have one, it is it's a serious headache. Yeah, it sticks out like a sore thumb. And Connor Cooney generally is good on freeze. Excuse mm. me. <clears throat> Um, so it was quite strange to see him so mass- miss them so much. And that kind of sucked the life out of them a small bit because they were on top in all sectors of the field. Yeah. Galway were utterly dominant. As you say, they were so physical. Um, and Water really could, or Wexford couldn't really penetrate them at that, at t- that time. But I thought like there's crucial moments in games that you just, I think the ruthless teams just take the right options. The Limericks would take the right options. That Joseph Cooney chance when he intercepted and he was down, yeah. bearing on goal. Just slip the pass in, ball in the back of the net, nothing to see here, back to Galway with the two yeah. points. That was Dear criminal. I was right oh. behind that. I was only about four rows back. It it was just such an obvious pass. We were and then he kinda of went down a rabbit hole and, and Matthew Hanlon blocked him. It was it was the pass was so glaringly obvious. Sometimes you could say, Ah oh, well, he wasn't in his eye light. He was right in front of him. He couldn't yeah. have missed him. But, and it's it's like he had a really, really good game, but that's the the couple of percent that just kills the game. And they just they just get out of there with the win. But look, the, the, although Wexford played poorly for long periods of that game, the return of Conor McDonald, like the last couple of years, I don't know if it's the daily game plan. I would say he was left isolated up there, but he just seemed to be back to life. He was yeah. brilliant. He fought off Dahi Burke a number of times. It was two v one. He how he got that goal, and I don't know. That was a huge positive. Lee Chin back was hugely positive. I suppose for Galway, Connor Whelan now, you look at the Kyle Hayes, how that might affect Limerick going yeah. forward if he is injured. Connor Whelan looked to give his hamstring a right little dart. I, I, I couldn't see, you couldn't see him back for another two weeks. He'll be a huge loss because we speak about this forward inside that can win ball 2v1. He is another one of those. Like, I don't think there's anyone better when the ball goes to ground as regards winning a ruck and creating something out of nothing. He is focal, particularly with Joe mm-hmm. Cannon going out that forward line. He's a big loss to him. So, you know, it's, it's, we still are relatively unknown with, with Galway. There was like the really good in the first half. In the second half, then they just kind of took the wrong options in lots of times and went out of the game. Cotton Mannion, you know, ran the show for long periods of the time. But, you know, I would still have some leadership questions over this Galway team. Who stood up really when they needed him in the last 15 minutes when Wexford had loads of leaders? Yeah. Um, it, Wexford, 
they did a lot right in the second half, particularly Rory. And as you said, like they got a bit closer to Conor McDonald because in the first half it was like the Davy days. He was he was he was two v one, and uh, with nobody within twenty yards and with the ball come down. And you're right, like he does a remarkable job of at least keeping the ball alive, at least keeping it out of a Galway hand where he needed a bit more support. Um, we worried after the Waterford game that um, you know, Wexford, if Rory O'Connor is bottled up, what happens? He had another quiet enough game. Um, you know, he was well marshaled, but um. It just shows what one player can do because Lee Chin came in and he seems to have changed his free taking style. It seems to be more accurate. It seems to be, he seems to be, it just seemed like he wasn't going to miss him. He's kind of got that TJ Reid kind of barely get it over the crossbar thing going on now, which is very nice to see. But also just his presence, the lift he gave the crowd. Um, you know, we're talking about teams losing players with this congested season, but there's also the opportunity for players to come back just at the right time and it could be so pivotal. Exactly, and I think they're in um, they're in a they're in a pretty good shape now, given the fact that they'll have got a big bounce out of actually, I suppose, you would winning say, the draw. Well, stealing a draw or Nick or, or grabbing a, a draw from snatching a draw from the jaws of defeat. I think that definite. And I said to you last week in terms of Wexford, I think they're very much a momentum side. Um, they have like. Has the draw been unkind to them in that they've got Galway Dublin in their first two fixtures? Yes and no. I think both games at home, I think, are absolutely key yeah. in the fact that Wexford Park is a very good place for them. They obviously, unlike Cork, by the way, who were only allowed train and Parky Cueve once in the three weeks in the build-up to the uh, to that to that match. And Sheard will probably get at least two rehearsals. Well, the, the mad thing, the mad, the mad thing for me, right? The mad thing for me is. What were they saving the pitch for if they're going to build a stage right in the middle of it? <laughs> yeah. I don't understand that, you know. Um, so that so they weren't they couldn't even get access to their own pitch in the build-up. But like Wexford, you know, they'll be training there every week. So like that's a really like they, they'll have a bit of momentum behind them now. Obviously, the home crowd is a big thing. Was the attendance a little bit disappointing, Mikey, with only ten thousand there? I th- I would have expected more. Um I don't know. The two stands are basically full, mm. and then you had a few on the Canard Terrace. Not, so not very many. The two would, terraces were quiet. So yeah, you wouldn't have many traveling either because it's so far. That's probably another aspect to it too. Yeah, there was a, there was a there was a decent smattering of Galway fans, but not that many. You're right. No, like that would be the the uh, the distance for the opponents was a big thing. But I suppose we have to mention it, Jackie. Just your opinion on the decision by Thomas Walsh. I was there. I was shouting. I won't. I won't pretend to be a, a, a neutral observer on this one or uh, <laughs> impartial journalist. That's, 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 that's that, isn't that? Isn't yeah. that what home advantage is, Jackie? That's what <laughs> yeah. you want. You won't want. You, like there's some places in the country, say Parky Cueve, if Cork's second game was there, might be a bit quieter, might be a bit emptier after the that first game, and Cork lose whatever advantage there might have been. There are some grounds in the country where you just kind of expect the crowd to make a noise. And that's sometimes what happens with a referee. It was, I think it was a wrong decision myself, but I was yeah. delighted with it. And I'm glad to say that I probably played some part in it. So that makes it all the sweeter. <laughs> <laughs> it was a, it was a strange decision. Yeah. Look, I, I think we all know that the, there was no consistency to Connor Clooney versus the Lee Chin. I, I would say without a doubt, there was, it was a hometown decision. Wexford Park is the, is without doubt the most intimidating place I have ever played in. And I mean that in the best way possible. They make their supporters count. They're hugely passionate. Even at times when Wexford were going poor and we go down and play them, by God, they would let you know about it, you know, in a really good way. Um, it, it just was very strange. He definitely buckled under the intimidation and the pressure that the crowd mounted on him. Um, and I, I couldn't really believe it, to be honest. But I will say something from it. The reaction of the Wexford players, like the ball was thrown in and Lee Chin handed over the bar within a couple of seconds, where Galway were still kind of stuck in the moment and giving out to the ref and things like that. You've got to get on with the game quick enough. But I just thought there was no consistency, uh, the Conor Cooney versus the Lee Chin one. Yeah. Is there something here, Rory, in free-taking routines and perhaps a need to kind of rein them in. This is a separate issue from goalkeepers coming up. I don't have an issue with goalkeepers coming up for penalties. That's almost part of the theatre. But you see it in Gaelic football now, goalkeepers coming up to take 45s and it's taken a minute and a half to take a 45 or but even just separate from that, just the routines that free-takers have now, they're getting more and more accurate. But you notice the Bakuni because there's quite, it's quite an elaborate thing. So when he takes five seconds before he starts into his routine that maybe the referee's looking and said, this guy's taking the piss. <laughs> but how long does it take, like, if Cork get a free in their half back line and they and they ask Patrick Horgan to come out and take mm. it? How long does it take Patrick Horgan to jog from the full forward line out to the half back line to take that? Like, 
Yeah, it's an, it's definitely an area, I think, in both codes, hurling and football, that they're going to have to start looking at. I think if you're going to be bringing lads out, I think, fine, we're adding 30 seconds on, you know? Um, mm. Now, that's a very, very difficult thing to do because it's not going to be the case for every free. Some frees, you might just allow your half-back half back, your half back to take it. But if it is the case, I don't know. I mean, like you're, what you should always be looking to try and do in every sport, whether it's GEA, soccer, whatever, is avoid dead play as much as possible. I, I remember a few years ago when we first started looking at those kinds of statistics and started timing it. The best you can hope for in a 70-minute game is about 50% of live action. So in, in effect, let's say a match is 75, 76 minutes long, and most of the ball is ever going to be in play is about 40 minutes. Mm. So you're looking at 30, 35 minutes of dead, just no, no, no action whatsoever. Ball going yeah. out over the end line, line balls, injuries, delays, all those types of things. So I think if you put it in rule that you're going to add this time on if lads are jogging out or you have some sort see like the issue i suppose really is if you start turning around you say look we're going to put a limit on it it's 15 seconds before you you have to take it i mean who's timing that then you know yeah he could make he could equally make the same mistake by leaving a fella go too long or too short ultimately it all came down to an individual interpretation that was put under pressure from a rabid local following and i think you know, they got they got their just rewards for shouting and roaring at him. And I think that's just part of it. I think ultimately what it, I would say is, I don't know how, I mean, Jesus, when I first walked into a dressing room, certainly with Nemo, the first thing they would always say to you, especially if you were playing local rivals, is take it out of the referee's hands. You know, don't leave him in a situation where he's making a decision that's going to end up costing you the game. And I think that's what happened Galway on Saturday night. Yeah. You'd look, you'd look for consistency. Or like, I, just a quick but one. That, but, but I, the, I, consistent, I, consistency, the consistency, but sure, Jackie, like we're hearing that. We're, we're looking for consistency in refereeing 120 years, you know, or 30 <laughs> years. That's like, you, you're, like you're, never, you're never going to get it, really. I remember when we would play and often when the captain would go up for a toss and the referee might have a conversation and look at lads today I'm you know I'm watching whatever third man tackle high tackle whatever if the referee said look at lads free when it, when there's a free awarded <clears throat> will you please instruct your free takers get out I'm not I, I don't want anyone hanging around I want to play a move and, and I'm going to be penalising and he consistently yeah. pr- applies that for the 70 yeah, minutes yeah. not in the dying minutes or suddenly to make a godlike up. decision yeah yeah. if he was doing that the whole 70 minutes he'd say look at Conor Cooney knew what he was uh, yeah. what he was doing he was applying it the whole game mm. it's his own fault and then did it for Leach in whatever case may be yeah. but when you just <laughs> pluck this out of this guy on the 73rd minute yeah. do that and then a, a crucial one two minutes later and he doesn't apply you just kind of go that's extremely strange and odd yeah um, well look we'll we'll preview the, the, the weekend matches more on Thursday but um Dublin are down in Wexford Park on Saturday evening and they had their fill of it against Leash, who um are travelling to Kilkenny and then Galway are hosting Westmead. So um again the Leinster Championship, the nature of it, we are gonna get a couple of games each weekend, or at least one game each weekend where we're kinda of shrug our shoulders and say, Well, we know who's gonna win that one. But um it, it's the nature of it. But Wexford v Dublin um could be a cracker there at five o'clock. Um just finally then, lads, before we go, um down to the Joe McDonough and a slightly strange he said, she said story emerging in Kerry. Um Stephen Malumphy uh, suggested the Kerry manager suggested after their um, their match of the weekend that uh, sorry that Shane Nolan had had dropped off the panel because he didn't want to be a sub. Shane Nolan uh, has done an interview. He did an interview in the Kerry Man yesterday where he said that's absolutely not the case. He said he's shocked and disappointed. He said he explained at the start of the year that he had a baby daughter due um, in April and that that was going to probably impact on his intercounty career because he's a family business as well. I think it's concrete and he works six days a week. Um, so, so Jackie, I, I think one thing you could always say about Brian Cody is never washed, never washed the, the, the dirty wa- uh, laundry in public. And, um, obviously we don't know who's telling the truth here and, you know, but it never pays really to, to make these kind of comments about players because the, the truth is very rarely black or white, is it? Yeah, it's, look, it's hard looking in from the outside. You'd like to hope that that's not the situation that, you know, if, if, if a guy is expecting a child and has flagged this early on in the year that, you know, he, he's not feeling the repercussions of But what, what I would say is I know when we were training with Kilkenny, we'd always be training at seven o'clock and, you know, everyone would be there at six and you'd be doing your warm up and everyone would be on the pitch for half six. But I always know in the summer, 
10 to 7, you would see baiting in the door, Noel Hickey, he'd be after out cutting corn, there'd be hay still in his hair, <laughs> and it's baiting in the door, bag all over the place, boots, could be missing the boot, whatever case may be. And Brian Coley <clears> would <throat> say a thing, he'd know Noel Hickey is, is one of his warriors, it's just a busy time for him. Nothing to see here, lads. And he come out and he bait lads left, right, and centre. <laughs> and he go back and cut another couple of hundred acres of corn. You know that kind of flexibility was was available. Brian was, yeah. you know, if you college or whatever the case may be, Brian knew, you know, the genuine lads and things like that. So um, I'd like to think common sense would would prevail here, and maybe a conversation that they need to sit down the two of them and trash it out and keep it in house would probably be the best thing here instead of going to the local press. And Aaron, as you say, Aaron, their dirty laundry uh, to, to, for the world to see. We yeah. need more farmers playing inter-county hurling. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> do. There's not enough farmers playing inter-county hurling anymore. That's the pity. As you say, I, th- I think every county would appreciate an old hickey about now. Imagine what an old hickey would do for the Cork defence. <laughs> <laughs> if there was a the time-travelling transfer. Stick him into, in, into the cryo chamber there and transfer <laughs> him down. He'd do a job, all right. He'd yeah. do a job. But Rory, um, Sh- Kerry aren't so blessed with depth in hurling that they can no, be doing without Shane Nolan. Yeah, it is. It's 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 a big loss to them, you know. So I suppose look, they just have to battle on. Unfortunately, uh, you know, like these things, especially for a country like that's trying to develop, trying to get up to the next level. I suppose to have it, as Jackie mentioned there, just to be, you know, have all this kind of come out and wash out in public. I think that's not great. You know, um, you have to remember, nobody signs any contracts here. Uh, people are entitled to step away anytime they want. They have uh, they have their own lives to lead. And if a fella is making a decision based on his career and his family, sure, like I mean, you know who we who's anybody to criticise a fella for doing that? Yeah, yeah. And it is looking interesting as well. The John McDonough obviously uh, Antrim beat Offaly by a point, and uh, mm. Down had a good win over Kerry. So. The Antrim um, Offaly game was meant to be a cracker. I didn't see any of it now, but I heard it was meant to be a fantastic game. Yeah. Yeah. 322 to 224. You can't go too far wrong with that. It was a, it was a long way south of that in a lot of the matches this weekend. So in the senior championship. Um, all right. Um, thank you very much to Jackie and to Rory. We'll be back. On, uh, we will be talking about hurling on Thursday. Problems. Jackie was mad to talk big ball this week, but we had to say, no, Jackie, look, we, we, we haven't got the time. We just have to focus on the hurling. Are you, are you, ta- are you talking out in the WD40 this year, Jackie? We're actually in a relegation final now coming up uh, this year now, Rory. I, ha- yeah, I haven't got the boots out yet so far, but um, <laughs> if I have to come back for relegation final, I'd say we could be in trouble. <laughs> to relegation square. to what? Is it, is it the fair and Intermediate. Square? Intermediate. Oh, okay. Are you, uh, <laughs> are you playing full forward? I, well, I haven't played this year, but if I am right. playing, I'd like, I hope my back is my 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 back is my own goal and not the opponent's goal. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. All right. Um, cheers to the lads. And we will chat to you on Thursday. We'll be previewing the weekend's football and hurling. So we'll see you then. Thanks very much. Good luck. Possession crucial from this. How much longer will the referee allow? Dublin lead by a point. And there's the whistle. It's over. It's over. We earned it by winning the last two matches on the road. And that's not going to be taken away from us. But what I love in hurling, I love players that will never give in. He hits it. He hits it. It's over the bar.